Thank you, Lorenzo. Thank you for coming. And uh, this is a good opportunity for me, almost the only opportunity, to thank Wizao for organizing this whole special semester uh, and the Institute, the IMS. And without further ado, let me tell you a little bit about uh, uh, my work and the work of others and the way w I, that I see of where we are going uh, in this uh, broad topic of collective dynamics. So uh, let me start. This is Craig Reynolds. I assume that most of you do not know him, some of you do. Craig Reynolds was an engineer in the 1980s in the Hollywood studios, and he was interested um, in making realistic simulation of, for flocking. And in 1987, he introduced a work in which he postulated three major rules. And the rules for re making realistic simulations for flocking were based on three types of interactions. Repulsion was one, alignment was the other one, and attraction was the third one. And the specifics, uh, actually quoting his paper, are, are outlined here. Um, these three type of interactions were also tied uh, into a specific geometric descriptions. You can think of neighborhoods which are made into concentric balls and you get in the immediate neighborhood, you get repulsion, in the next layer you get alignment, and finally you get attraction which keeps the group together. And this, uh, again, was uh, in order to make a realistic description of locking, and this is how it looks. So, I mean, the grant, okay, so now let's see. Okay, let me. Yes, video and PC, I agree that it's the one thing that makes, <laughs> takes it better. I did try it before, but. Uh, now, here it is. So these are the, uh, this is a simulation of what uh, Craig Reynolds called boids, bird-like objects. And what you see here, you get uh, groups, this is on the two-dimensional torus, they do not collide. As they get closer, they align, they keep together, and they, they, they get the same directions. Um, and of course, when they get close, they somehow merge without collision. So the alignment plays a role. In fact, when you turn off now the alignment, you can see that they break down and they behave in a particle-like behavior. But this is not what we are looking because this is not realistic modeling for flocking. A realistic modeling for flocking is when you turn the alignment and you can see that uh, sub-crowds uh, turn in the, to the same direction, so it goes on and on. Let me skip that. Um, the point is that the same kind of ingredients appear in the, in the emergent behavior in completely different topics, in ecology for the behavior for fish and birds, sheep, bacteria, locusts, and insects, in social dynamics, the behavior of uh, human interactions from pedestrian and to opinions, voting, and marketing. These are all subtopics that I picked up from what I expect will be the topics of some of the lectures here. And then in sensor-based networks, uh, from macromolecules to metallic roads and, and to uh, robot networks. In all these cases, what distinguishes um, collective dynamics from physical particles is that the collective dynamics that we have in mind, they have two things which distinct the, distinguish them, and these are senses and or sensors. Um, in 1998, Craig Reynolds, uh, he got the Oscar for technical achievement for this kind of simulation. Uh, he, he's actually a very nice person, and he visited me in, in Maryland, um, very modest. Uh, nevertheless, he got the, uh, the, the, the Oscar for that. And to date, we still do not have a mathematical theory which cover the basic framework that uh, was introduced in 1987 by Craig Reynolds. And this is more or less um, the general framework that I would like to cover, to, to have a mathematical framework that will address the local aspect in the theory of uh, Craig Reynolds. To do that, um, before we do that, let me just 
make a, a favorite slide about the different things that we have in mind. Namely, uh, we have an, an example of interaction of living agents at the top, flock of birds, a school of fish, uh, in particular, the formation of tissues made out of cells, or we have interactions of um, human crowd, traffic jam, opinion dynamics, and then we have non-living agents, uh, and they are, they are shown here below. And the key question, so it's important actually to, to crystallize the key question, is this fascinating phenomena of self-organization where there is a unity that comes from within without uh, an external forcing. So the question is, how short range local interaction, which fits into all these cases that I mentioned before, lead to the emergence of higher order structure or higher order patterns? So this is the major, major question. The patterns could be flocks or swarms. They could be called parties or consensus. But the key issue is how something from the small evolves or emerges into something in the large. So, uh, even though I will mention that the, the, there are no external forcing, I will end the talk by adding external forcing to the mix. So I would like to introduce here a general framework that will unify this approach. And I offer this unified approach in terms of anticipation dynamics. So ant for anticipation dynamics, we have an Hamiltonian, which is given up there. And the dynamics is a simple Hamiltonian dynamics, but with one twist. The twist is that we react not to the current stage, but we react to the anticipated stage. Na namely, at time t, we react to the state anticipated at uh, time t plus tau, namely in a little while, which is a very human type of reaction. So when tau equal to 0, this is the classical n-particle system is Hamiltonian Hn. When tau is positive, we refer to social particles that they react to the anticipated position rather than the position right now. Okay. So anticipation, let me remind you, is a main feature of collective dynamics of social particles in contrast to particles, namely to living organisms, to robots, to everything that have either senses or sensors. And they uh, can be found in mean field games, in dynamical system. This framework was introduced in 2017 in this reference. And before we continue, let me just mention one important feature. In this kind of anticipation dynamics, we have an anticipation energy. That is, we have the kinetic energy and the anticipated Hamiltonian at the anticipated position, which is uh, tagged here by the super index tau. So we measure the state at the anticipated position. And this anticipated energy, denoted here by curl E, is depleting as long as the dynamics continues. So it stops depleting only when vi dot equal to 0. Here are several simulations from that paper in 2017. I do not have time to, to uh, elaborate on everything. But just to show you in several slides that starting with a random initial configuration, you can run to a completely uh, different uh, configuration later on, depending on the various parameters. So this is one example, another example, and then a third example, all taken from this 2017 paper. So clearly, anticipation dynamics, unlike Hamiltonian dynamics, offers a wide spectrum of different behavior as t tends to infinity. And that's what we would like to learn. And I offer this as a unified framework for the um, basic uh, premise that was introduced by Reynolds. Let me show you what the connection is. So we will take into account now the case that the Hamiltonian is given by this pairwise interaction. So there is a potential, a radial potential, and we see the Hamiltonian dictated by these pairwise interactions, in which case we have the anticipation dynamics, and this will be the main object of our, this discussion given here. It is essentially a two-point particle uh, interaction, but with one twist, that the dynamics actually takes into account the anticipated position rather than the original positions. That is to say, if tau equal to 0, this is the usual pairwise end body problem. But we take into account the case that tau is positive. When tau is positive, when you expand the right hand side here, you get two terms. This is the first term, and this is the second term. In the first term, I abuse the notation that will be particularly useful for me, and I will denote by u prime ij the uh, 
derivative of this radial function, the potential normalized by the relative distances. So these are scalar amplitudes, and these are attributed to the usual uh, n-particle system, pairwise interaction. But there is a second term. There is a second term once we expand the right-hand side, and the second term has to do now with the Hessian of u evaluated some intermediate point and taking the difference in the pairwise velocities rather than pairwise positions. And so we get two contributions. And I will, would like to study now this system simply because the matrix phi ij, which is the Hessian at some intermediate points, these intermediate points are not accessible. And therefore, I will forget about the fact that the phi ij are derived from the Hessians. And I will study now a general, let me call it a system phi u, which involves an alignment term. Here it is, in terms of general symmetric positive definite matrices phi ij. And here is the attraction and repulsion, which comes from the original anticipation dynamics. So let me summarize what we have here in the phi u system. We have now two terms. Here's the second term, which has to do with the attraction and repulsion. So these are the pairwise interaction. And here is the new term due to anticipation, which comes into alignment. Tau equal to 0 is the Hamiltonian dynamics. This is this term. I will shade this term because this is the familiar thing that we have in Hamiltonian dynamics. And let me concentrate now on the case when tau is positive. Namely, let me concentrate on an alignment term. The twist here, however, paint, I would like to highlight the fact that the coefficients here are matrices. And these matrices, again, are induced by the Hessian of our potential. So here it is. So the phi ij are given by the Hessian of this potential. And in fact, they are given in terms of rank 1 matrices, which are expressed here. Again, I shade here the less critical things that I would like to focus. I would like to focus on the second radial derivative of the u's, which are given here. And therefore, I will reduce the whole problem into the case that we get scalar interaction, unlike the matrix interaction. And finally, we derived rather than postulate the cuckoo smell dynamics. So in this manner, we, in systematic way, we derive the cuckoo smell dynamics as a special case of anticipation dynamics. And what I would like to do now is, of course, to study the large time behavior as a special case of this anticipation model. So the interaction particle, let, uh, the interaction protocol, let us remind ourselves, is usually based on geometric neighborhood, because we will depart from that later on. And in this case, when we have a scalar interaction, uh, this di dictates a neighborhood so that agent i, its velocity, is aligned by those neighbors which are included, supported in an i. In the typical case, the phi ij are function of the relative distances. And therefore, this defines balls of radius r0, where r0 is the diameter of the support of the um, interaction function, which is given to the model. And what is the structure of phi? Phi is, of course, context dependent and is general not known. So since it's not known, there are various ways to try to, to go around it. It's either derived empirically or postulated based on phenomenological argument, which will be mostly the case here. Or in recent works, there are uh, works where the phi is being learned from the data. And here's a recent work from the group of Magioni. Since this is the scenario here, what I would like to study is how different classes of phi affect the collective dynamics. So I will not focus on specific phi. I would like to concentrate on a class of inter interaction um, protocols, that is the phi's, and to see how they affect the large time behavior. And in this case, there are two. I would like to distinguish between two main classes of dynamics. The first class is when we have fat tail kernels, namely when phi decays slowly in this Pareto-like behavior. It's given here. And this is the case that most, almost exclusively all the literature goes for the last 10 years. And we know quite about, about, we know quite about this case of having a fat tail or long range. The other case is when we have short range interactions, namely where the diameter of the interaction kernel essentially is finite, is much smaller than the diameter of group. In fact, this is precisely what Craig Reynolds alluded to in his original work in the 1987. And this is precisely when we know practically nothing. 
because this is the most realistic case, and this is exactly what I'm running after. So these are the two classes, fat tails and short-range interaction. Let me talk a little bit about what we know, and then try to explain what is the difficulty with the short-range interactions. Okay, before we, we continue, uh, let us remind ourselves a canonical classes of um, interaction protocols. Here's the um, celebrated Kukas male model. The Kukas male model came with an interaction kernel which decays in algebraic manner of degree, in this case gamma. And we know that depending on the uh, intensity of gamma, uh, it dictates whether or not we will get uh, flocking behavior. Notice that in this case, the, of course, the support is infinite. The second case is a case of a singular kernels, which is based on risk potentials. Um, the main issue here is that we f strongly favor those that immediately neighboring to us, but pay attention, we still have a fat tail. So we take into account an infinite domain. And finally, I would like to refer to the Vickshek model, which of course has many other parameters, the noise, it has to do with the orientation, but the most important thing in the Vickshek model that was introduced first in 1995 is that the interaction is local. Namely, it's the characteristic function of a ball of radius R0, and it is not global. And in this sense, the analysis of the Vickshek model is indeed very complicated. So these are three canonical examples for interaction protocols. And let me see what we know about the behavior of flocking. So here's the, the recipe. We have a repulsion, we have an attraction, we have an alignment. And I distinguish in the repulsion and the attraction in the sign of U prime. If the sign is negative, then we have a repulsion. If the sign is positive, then we have an attraction. And in between, we have this new term, which is the alignment term. So this is the general framework that is induced by anticipation. And the canonical example that we should think of uh, in terms of the potential U is a potential that is decreasing. So here's the repulsion part. So we repel if the agents are too close. Then there is a region here uh, of an alignment. It is not exactly clear in what sense they overlap. And finally, farther away, we have a uh, attraction and the slope here is very important because this dictates the tail of the phi. So this is the Reynolds rules of engagement. It's three geometric zones. We see them there, and we see this in this structure. Here's the alignment, here's the repulsion, and here's the attraction. And what I would like to do now is to study in systematic way alignment plus attraction. So I will mention now a few new results about alignment and attraction. Uh, we will basically normalize everything with the potential to be uh, at the origin zero. So essentially, you should think that we cut, we cut the potential here, and we take it to, to the origin. The question is, what about the repulsion? Well, the answer is the, the, the case of repulsion is mostly open. There are basically no results about the repulsive case, even though it seems rather simple, but it is far more complicated than it seems. So what do we have about alignment and attraction? So here's the first result with Ru and Shu. So we are thinking about an alignment, and this is an attraction, pay attention, the U prime is assumed to be positive. We will assume that the potential decays slowly in this manner. So this is a Pareto type decay, and we have a convex potential. This is the phi U system, and the first result says that if the potential has a fat tail, and if we have long range alignment so that the interaction of phi also decays slowly, remember that now I assume that U and phi are completely independent, because I do not have access to the Hessian of U, and phi should stand essentially for some intermediate Hessian. In these two cases, it follows that the energy fluctuation tends to zero. So we get both flocking and concentration at a fractional exponential rate. Uh, in particular, we obtain flocking, namely all the velocities will approach the, the initial average. And this is the precise rate which has to do with gamma, and gamma has to do with the how slow, how, how fat is the tail. And in particular, this implies flocking for the, syst the case of a system caucus male. This by itself is a new result. It's just a byproduct of what we did. This by itself is a new result which is highly non-trivial. And it is very important. It is very important to deal with the case of what I would say system caucus male, namely the interaction has to do with matrices 
for reasons that I will have to elaborate in the future. So again, now we have matrices here that are symmetric, and the question is, what is the large time behavior of Cocker's mail with a protocol which involves matrices? And the, st the statement is that there is this fractional exponential decay dictated by how fat the fat tail of phi is. So this is result number one. The result number two deals with the case that we have fat tail attraction potential, which need not be um, convex. And in this case, we directly look at anticipation dynamics. So this is an anticipation dynamics. If you expand it, you get the two terms I mentioned before. The second term will have to do with the Hessian. And the statement now is that if you look at the anticipated energy, given here, notice that it's anticipated because we take into account the anticipated position, you get flocking and concentration uh, at a fractional exponential rate. And, uh, by the way, it's surprising we do not have to assume any convexity. And the proof here and in the previous case is based on three major uh, components, which seems to be really an integral part of this theory. And here are the three components. First, you have to assume that uh, you have to address, one way or the other, a pointwise control on how fast the, the crowd grows. So in this case, we see that the diameter of the, grow, the group grows, but not exponentially fast, but only polynomially fast, again dictated by gamma. Gamma is to do with the fatness of the tail. Once we have this, we have partial coercivity, namely the energy fluctuation decay, and you are familiar with this quantity from before, and this is translated to this kind of uh, decay of the fluctuation in the position. It almost closes the coercivity estimate, but we need to get a decay not just of the fluctuation of the positions, but also fluctuation, of course, of the velocities, and this is done by hypercoercivity argument. And, and this seems to be a, a, the same theme in, 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 in everything that we do. So these are the anticipation uh, systems in general, and, 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 the, and the message, the take-home message is the following. If you have a fat tail, then you get flocking and even concentration in space. Now the question is, beyond fat tail, why do we need this fat tail? We still did not address the question that was raised in 1987. So let's go back to the emergent behavior as t tends to infinity and address the question, why fat tail? To do this, I, I, I reduce the question now to the scalar case, and um, I would like to, 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 to zoom into this problem of large time behavior in the following way. So what we have is, is uh, this kind of dynamics with a scalar Cooker's mail, and I would like to interpret it as dynamics on a graph. So I think that there is, I think of it as a graph with vertices, uh, collection of vertices V, where I place each one of the agents, and then the um, edges, E will, so here are the vertices, and the edges will be quantified by the, by the question whether or not there is a co communication or interaction, phi ij, between agent at vertex, a, uh, vertex, vertex i and vertex j. And once we have this graph, I will define on this graph the gradient along this graph, which is defined here, and with this, I can start the, the whole analysis because once we have the, the, the gradient, which depends on the communication, then the dual of the gradient is given by the divergence. And when we take the divergence of the gradient, we get the Laplacian, and this turns out to be exactly the action which comes in Cooker's mail. So this means that the Cooker's mail is nothing but uh, the heat equation, the weighted heat operator on the graph, and it's given here. So we have a Laplacian. This is the graph Laplacian. This graph Laplacian is induced by the interaction function or the interaction protocol phi. And then what we have on the graph Laplacian is that the collection of vertices, the collection of velocities is given by minus grad the Laplacian. In computer science, the Laplacian is positive, not negative. So we have to introduce this minus. And we just have to study the large time behavior of this heat equation. And the way to study that is in this case um, to, to basically look at the fluctuations and the fluctuations here, the rate of change of fluctuation equals um, to minus the negative sign, the, minus the Laplacian. So we have to study the negativity of the Laplacian. 
And here we have to use the Poincaré inequality, namely to show that the Laplacian, which you remember in this, our case is positive, is bounded from below by the fluctuation. If this is the case, then we end up with ground rate inequality if we have this contractivity factor eta such that we will have this kind of Poincaré inequality. So this is a property of the graph. This is solely a property of the graph. If we have this property with a positive number eta, we can integrate this ground rate inequality and we are done. So when this property holds, since these are all equalities so far, it turns out that this equality holds in a sharp way, namely we have this coercivity bound in terms of the second eigenvalue of the Laplacian, which is called the Fiddler number. And the reason for this long discussion is that the second eigenvalue of the Laplacian, called the Fiddler number or the spectral gap, dictates the connectivity of our graph. Namely, we do not have to have global connection between all the agents, but we have to make sure that the graph remains connected. If the graph will break the connectivity at a finite time, then the Fiedler number will vanish and we will not get flocking. In fact, flocking holds if and only if the integral of this eta is infinite, not only that it has to be positive, it has to be infinite, namely we want this contractivity to have fat tail, in which case we will get then and only then flocking, and the flocking will go to the uh, average behavior. So this is the connection for the fat tail, and if we have long range interaction, namely uh, if phi has a finite infinite support, then we get unconditional flocking, which is the usual framework in the literature. And this holds if we have this kind of polynomial de de decay if gamma is less than one, which brings us to the original work of uh, Cooker and Smale. If gamma is greater than one, then we do not have a fat tail, and then we have only conditional flocking. Okay. So this is the framework of a global interaction. We need a fat tail in order to keep the connectivity unconditionally. Of course, it raises the question, what about short-range interaction? What happens with short-range interaction, we can start with a connected graph, and at a finite time, the connectivity will break down, and from there on, we really do not know. And that's basically where we are. So in fact, uh, the breakdown into clusters, because essentially propagation of connectivity is unstable, here is a canonical example uh, of opinion dynamics. This is time. This is propagation of scalar opinion, prop, uh, distribution of scalar opinions from 0 to 10. They are definitely connected with this connectivity uh, interaction function, which is the characteristic function of the interval 0, 1. And you can see that over time here, you get four parties whose distance is larger than 1. So connectivity breaks down, whereas here, we just change the protocol of interaction. We do get consensus. So in one case, we can get breakdown into different clusters. In another, we do not clearly depends on the phi, and the question is how the phi affect the large time behavior, and this is an open question that I was quite interested in the last more than three years. So this led us to the discussion about heterophilous dynamics and homophilous dynamics. Uh, this goes back to a work with, uh, with Sebastian Moch in 2014 that was later addressed and analyzed in the first order scalar case by Garnier uh, and, and his co-authors in this paper from 2017. But he did not address the general framework uh, about the possible breakdown of connectivity. Okay. So what do we do now? Now that uh, we have to accept the idea that the discrete dynamics is unstable, so the problem is unstable. So there is no answer about the large time behavior with short range interaction. That's the bottom line. There is no answer to that because the problem is unstable. End of story. So this brings me, so that's what we are looking at. We are looking at this kind of uh, cooker smell dynamics. The phi ij is short range, it has finite support, and in general, there is no uniform answer which will tell us under certain condition that we will get flocking depending on certain configuration. So this brings uh, a, a favorite qu quotation of, my, of mine, which has the following. However, I'm sorry for those who have heard it already. However obscure the causes permit us to hope that what seems complex and chaotic in the, for, in the context of single individual may be seen from the standpoint 
of, from the standpoint of the human race as a whole to be steady and progressive, though slow evolution of its original endowment. Let me translate. It basically says that if you use the problem for finite n, it may be unstable. If you let n tends to infinity, it should be stable. This was not said by neither Boltzmann, not by Maxwell, but before them it was said by Immanuel Kant. And based on this recommendation, my suggestion is we will go from n, finite n to infinite n, and that's the next slide. So we look at the large crowd dynamics. We have an empirical distribution, which is written here. And by letting n tends to infinity, we will have a limit, and I will not elaborate on that, which is a distribution function depending on the time, position, and microscopic velocity v. And this distribution function will be realized in terms of its first two moments, which brings us immediately to the hydrodynamic description, which is given here. Namely, we get an hydrodynamic description in terms of the mass equation for the density and the momentum, which is given here. The momentum itself depends on two red quantities, which are not specified here. The first quantity is the alignment. This actually encodes the kind of interaction that we had before. And it is encoded here in terms of interaction uh, kernel phi, which need not depend even on the distance. It just depends on my location and the position of my neighbors. Here is my velocity. Here is the velocity of my neighbors. And I take into account all the relative distances in velocities weighted by their own density. And this is the encoding of the alignment term in general. Notice the amplitude here of the alignment is lambda. And then the other thing has to do with the pressure, which was already mentioned today in Young, Phil, Choi talk, which will not be resolved, of course, in this context, because we have to take into account the stress tensor. This involves the kinetic terms, and we need some new information, either Maxwellian or some sort of a closure. So I will push this aside exactly as was done before, and I will assume that the pressure will be zero. However, I would like to mention, and that's extremely important, everything that I will say from now on applies even when we do not close this pressure law. OK. So assuming that we get the uh, ansatz, which is a Dirac mass around the macroscopic velocity, I can assume that the pressure will go to 0. And I would like now to see the competition between the hydrodynamics and the alignment. And we are at this point. This is the uh, system that we are looking at. And we have a precise balance of energy fluctuation. So thanks to the fact that I eliminated the pressure, the precise balance of energy fluctuation mimics exactly what we have in the discrete case. Namely, the energy fluctuation on the left is balanced by what I will call the entropy. Its rate of change is given exactly by minus lambda times the energy fluctuation weighted by the communication kernel. In this case, it's a function of x minus y. It could be any other kernel. And now the question is to see how the entropy enforces the fluctuation, if at all, to go to zero, and what is the condition for that to hold. So the immediate conclusion is that if we pull out phi, and we pull out the minimal value of phi, which I will call, by a, I will call eta, then we get exactly what we had before. So eta stands essentially for the Fiddler number that we had before. And if the communication kernel here phi decays uh, slowly, it has a fat tail, gamma is less than 1, then this implies unconditional flocking. And this mimics what we have in the discrete case. And more or less, I close the chapter on everything that was done in this area um, for long-range interactions. OK. Fine. And this brings me finally to the question that was raised in 1987 by Craig Reynolds. So what do we know? about short-range interactions. I don't have a definite answer for that, I should mention. But as a result of working in the last three years on, on these questions, uh, on these qu specific questions, several uh, conclusions emerge, and I would like to share them with you. So from long range to more realistic short range, so d is the diameter of the initial crowd. r0 is the diameter of the support. We assume that it's much smaller than d, so they are really long-range interactions. And basically, we have this basic bookkeeping. And the question is very simple. Find the lower bound for the entropy in terms of the fluctuation of the energy. This is it. Nothing more than that. OK. 
So we're looking for a lower bound for the entropy. So the first result uh, with, with Morales and Peshek is just a basic statement which essentially says the following. Let me jump here. It says that if lambda, which is the intensity of the alignment, is large enough, then if you have initial connectivity, you stay connected because the entropy dominates the fluctuation. And this is sort of reminiscent to what was mentioned before uh, uh, in both talks about the Kuramoto, even though it's a completely different, of course, framework. Namely, if you have strong enough alignment, in this case, then it dominates and the connectivity is not being lost. The information propagates. So that's the first time that I use the word information, but not the last time. The important thing is that the information among all the members in the crowd propagate and it stays like that over time. So this is basically the, the, the statement that the communication at all scale, at scale R, there is a small scale here, uh, persists in time. Okay. The second, uh, the second statement of short range interaction, this should be number two, is given here and now I will not assume that lambda is large enough, but I will assume that I have a bounded kernel and it's short range uh, because it's bounded from below and above by this um, electricity kind condition. Again, R0 is much less than the support. So here's a general statement, the first statement about short range interaction, and it tells the following. This applies in the, 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 the case of multidimensional bounded kernel when we work on a uh, torus because we need the spectrum to be discrete. I will assume that the integral of phi is normalized to be one, and the statement reads the following. If the density fluctuation, namely the difference between rho max and rho min given here, is not too large, not too large with respect to what? With respect to the mean of one minus the Fourier coefficients of phi k. I know that it's rather strange that the Fourier coefficients of the uh, communication kernel enters, but they, it enters in a very natural manner. It's really an integral part of the problem. So notice that if the integral of phi is one, the zeros Fourier coefficient is of course one, and all the other Fourier coefficients are strictly less than one. So essentially it gives us a threshold such that if the initial, if the perturbation of the density are not too large, and in particular you do not hit vacuum, then the density carries the information and you will get global smooth, that global smooth solution must flow. Of course, we, I do assume here that the solution exists and it's smooth, and this result is independent of the size of the support. There is a question, when do we have global smooth solution? It is an open question, I do not know. So this is the second step. The third step has to do when we have short range interaction, but this time with a singular kernel. As we know, singularity helps because once we have singular kernels, the, inter the, the interaction is much stronger. So here are several results. When we have singular kernels on the torus, the first result of Roman Schweitko uh, and myself says the following. It's a beautiful result. It says if the, the density is bounded from below, so it does not hit, uh, it does not hit um, a vacuum, then, then this is it. You get flocking. So this seems like an, an ideal result. Because only, the only thing you have to show is that the density is staying bounded away from, from vacuum. But the reason that it's not an ideal result is that this is not realistic. For reasons which I do not understand, I know that the threshold for the minimal density behaves like 1 over t and not 1 over square root t. So if you can prove this bound, essentially you can prove that you stay away from vacuum. And if you stay away from vacuum, it is true that uh, there is flocking. But this does not include that. So in some sense, the assumption here, you do not see it, but it's a little bit too strong to my taste. On the other hand, in the one-dimensional case, there is a beautiful result uh, given here, which simply says, independently of anything, this is a global result, you get flocking. This is the one-dimensional uh, torus, so it's a global result. You cannot run away because you go to the left, you go to the right, you always hit with your member of the crowd and eventually they come together. So this is an unconditional result, but it, 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 uh, it takes place only in the one-dimensional torus. In two-dimensional torus, you can always create uh, scenarios that you will not meet your, your neighbors often enough for this to hold. Okay. So we get unconditional flocking for short-range interaction, uh, and, and this is written 
I, I want to, to, to remind ourselves that for, for long range, we have a series of results here, but this is, of course, uh, we are talking about uh, short range interactions. And the question in, in this case remains, when smooth solution exists, the problem is open. Okay, so what do we see here? What is the message that we learn from, the, from this work? Is that the propagation of information is critical. In fact, when we think about the mass and momentum equation, we always come into this uh, momentum behavior and so forth. I mean, this is completely secondary. The most important is the behavior of the density. If we know that we stay away from vacuum, then this is the critical element because the density carries the information, the propagation of information. So it's the second time that it becomes clear that this is about the propagation of information and not about fluids. And this brings us to a new paradigm that worked out with Roman Schweitkoi in this, in this work. And the new paradigm says the following, that the interaction between agents does not depend on the relative distance, but depends on how dense the area between them. And when you come to think about it, it's quite obvious. It is true that unlike particles, collective dynamics, because the agents have sensors and sensors, they probe the environment and they are not affected by the, the, the forces that act upon the environment, in short, they are active matter, they really probe the environment and therefore they take into account the density. So when we think about pedestrian dynamics, propagation of information and many other cases, the interaction between you as one agent and another agent takes into account how dense, how crowded is the region between you two. If it's less crowded, the information propagates faster. If it's more crowded, it decays it propagates slower. And in fact, at this stage, it became obvious that what we discuss here is the propagation of information and nothing else. So this was the new paradigm that we wanted to study here. So here are two agents, and here is a domain of propagation of information, which we call omega xy. And this, the crowdedness in this domain will dictate how fast the information goes from this agent to that agent, and it's symmetric. So we set a topological distance rather than geometric distance, which is essentially the total mass scaled by the dimension, and this will, we will call the topological distance. And now the communication does not depend on the geometric distance, but one over the topological distance. So this is a singular kernel depending on the topological distance. And we will take into account a short-range kernel. So we take a kernel, we cut it, in a finite ball, and within the ball, the interaction depends on the topological distance. So we do not communicate well with those that are very uh, masked by a large crowd, but we communicate very well if there is emptiness, which makes sense. And in this case, we were able to show that this kind of protocol, well, so there's a long story here that I should mention. Since we are talking about singular kernel, one has to make sense of point-wise sense of this operator. So there's a long story that I will skip due to time. And let me go now to the main result. And the main result, which is multidimensional, it says if you have short range topological kernel, here they are, this is short range, this is topological because it depends on the topological distance. And if we, have, if we stay away from vacuum when the density is greater than 1 over t, not 1 over square root t, then you get flocking. And the key issue here is the propagation of information. And indeed, we actually took a more general case when we have a product of geometric cutoff and topological distance. And um, the, the, let me skip here various things and also why we call it topological. I, I, due to time, I have to skip a few things. Uh, we were um, able to show that in certain general set of parameters, if the density is bounded away again, like one over T, then we get flocking. And here's the key estimate. The key estimate is sort of a Campanatus-like estimate, which tells us that when you look at the velocity minus its local average, this kind of uh, uh, difference, is bounded from, is a lower bound for the familiar entropy that I mentioned before. This is the quantity that I would like to have a lower bound. This is the entropy that I have to take into account, and the lower bound is given by this kind of Campanato estimate over a small ball, and once we have that, we take x minus and x plus as two agents, and then we show that there is a connection of balls, and due to these overlapping balls, the information propagates, and it never breaks 
down. Okay. Fine. So this is the story of the, the um, topological behavior. Of course, the question is, do smooth solutions exist? We do not know except one case. In the one-dimensional case, somehow there is this magic quantity E, which explains everything. And indeed, in the one-dimensional case, we can show that there is global smooth solution and the density stay away from, from, from vacuum. And therefore, we get unconditional flocking of short-range 1D topological model. Okay. So this is another time that the propagation of information appears there. And in fact, it actually propagated the recent work again with Ru and Shu, which brings us back to the discrete case, which actually highlights the fact that it is the propagation of information which is so critical. Let me explain to you what's going on here in the discrete case. We look at the topological distance. So there are two agents at location xi and xj, and these two agents measure how crowded is the region between them. It counts all the elements in between normalized by n. Of course, if this fraction is close to 1, then everything is saturated. There is no communication. But if the, this number, the, 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 the discrete density is less than, say, some number theta, then the communication will go. And therefore, this brings us to the following model. And the model says that uh, the communication is essentially the characteristic function is a function of theta times the, uh, this discrete uh, crowdedness to the power n. Essentially, it says that if the crowdedness is less than theta, then there is a full communication. And if it's more than theta, then there is no communication. Even though it's a discrete case, the conclusion is that alignment with this topological uh, cutoff leads to unconditional flocking. This is non-trivial result because I just told you that the discrete case is unstable. The discrete case based on geometric distances, based on topological distances, this result is essentially combinatorial. So one has to count the agents and to see how they are distributed. So this is the fourth step in short-range interaction. And again, we see that it has to do with communication. And it brings me to the short-range interaction, the, the fifth step, which has to do with games. So this is the most recent result with uh, Siming He. And the story goes like this. We will assume that there are several species. So far, we talked about the fact that there is one crowd of the same type. And the communication in this crowd is always the same thing, which is a very minimal framework. Let's take the case that there are several species. So what's the, def what's the definition of species? So you see you have a species alpha and a species beta. And the guys in, of species alpha and species beta, they have a different kind of communication is a different kind of communication protocol, a function which I will call phi alpha beta. So you have different subcrowd, and they have different kind of communicating among them, a much more realistic case. OK? So why I'm so excited about that? So you take the case that these subcrowds are very large, and you get this kind of multi-species dynamics. Notice that now you have a collection of phi alpha beta. And the theorem says the following. Smooth solution must flock. Let's assume that this system is global smooth solution, which is a story by itself, I know. Let's consider this array of uh, communication kernels. And let's assume that this array is connected. Only connectivity matters. You just have to propagate the information. What does it mean that this array is connected? It means that, that the second eigenvalue, the spectral gap of the appropriate Laplacian, that's essentially what it says here, has a fat tail. In this case, all the members of all the crowds will go to the same direction. And why is it a game? Here is an example. So let's, let's take the case that we have two groups or two species here. So this is one group and this is another group. And here are the rules. Group number one, members in group number one does not pay attention to their own kind. The only thing they look at is just the neighbors in the other group. And group number two, do not take account of their own kind. They only look at the first group. So this is a canonical example of a game. You just look at the other one, completely ignoring your own. So in this case of a game, both of them will get to the same limit. And the reason is because there is connectivity. The information is never lost. And of course, you can generalize it to an n by n uh, uh, scenarios as long as the matrix of uh, the protocol of communication is connected. Connectivity is the main thing. And that's basically what we learned so far. 
Okay. And then uh, let me move now to anticipation dynamics. I started with anticipation dynamics. Let's take n tends to infinity. The anticipated dynamics brings uh, up a very interesting uh, uh, hydrodynamics, or basically anticipated hydrodynamics, which is written here. In this case, we take the gradient of the potential, not of x minus y. It's not the convolution, but it's a convolution in the anticipated position. And notice that the anticipated position, of course, has to do with the local velocity. So it's a highly nonlinear model. And the question is, what is the large time behavior? I do not know anything about the existence. And the statement is, of course, that the anticipated energy is decaying in this fashion. This is equality. It decaying as long as the, there is dynamics. And the result is that if you have attractive potential, we know nothing about repulsion. If you have attractive potential and it has a fat tail, then the anticipated support does not grow too fast. And essentially, you convert, you have a limiting behavior which converge to the uh, uh, full alignment as anticipated. So the fluctuation decay to zero. So, so this is the, the story in this uh, anticipation uh, hydrodynamics. And then uh, let me summarize by, by asking where we are now. So where are we now? We have repulsion, alignment, and attraction in a discrete case. Uh, and then uh, we know uh, in this tree zone, so this is basically brings us to the question of Craig Reynolds. Uh, I didn't say anything about repulsion. Uh, so we are working on this in various modes of operation. Um, and unlike the first order model, should, I should mention, by the way, because I know that some people work on the first order model, that's different in the second order model, fundamentally different. So we, we, it is not clear how the repulsion plays a role, but it completely changes the, the large time behavior because so far I just talked about large time behavior which goes to a point. Namely, we just have a concentration uh, into one cluster. Of course, we get something much more interesting once there is a repulsion. So we don't know anything about the repulsion. Uh, and in fact, we want to change this whole paradigm from geometric into topological because I find it to be a more realistic uh, modeling. And we study now the emergence in the presence of repulsion, alignment, and attraction with topological interactions. Of course, we have to remember that in life, it's not just closed system. We also have external forcing. So let me conclude with yet another work uh, with Ruben Shu, earlier work, where we take the original alignment model, but now we add a uh, external forcing. It turns out that the, external, the presence of external forcing makes the dynamics completely different and considerably more interesting. So uh, here's an example. In this case, we have to consider Again, the fluctuation of the energy, but in this case, the decay of the energy is not exponential anymore. It decays in this fashion, and we cannot expect to have it uh, exponential. So that's fundamentally different than the behavior without external forcing. And in particular, if you take the quadratic potential, which is a very specific case here, what we found out that the, the dynamics uh, concentrate along a harmonic oscillator rather than a point, and this is a good point to conclude in order to show you that there is something richer than just consensus. So here's an example. So what you see in this specific dynamics, it zoom in all the time, and you can see how the crowd concentrate along this um, harmonic oscillator. And, and, and that basically has to be taken into account when we do this grand design for the program of Cray Reynolds. So this is where we are at now. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, but if you take the topological without a short range, then then I know the answer. Then I know that there will be um, uh, I know that there will be a um, unconditional flocking. So let, let let me say here a few things. The topological is actually uh, quite more complicated than it seems. This, why topological? First of all, because when you think about the discrete case, the factor what it means is that you are being affected by your immediate neighbors. 
That, that's de facto what this topological uh, distance means. So put differently, uh, uh, if I'm an agent I, and I look at my, at my environment, I'm being affected mostly by those that are immediately next to me. And as you, ca you take the distances further and further away, of course, the, the density will increase and therefore you will not be affected as it happens in reality, except one case. So let's assume that, let's talk about birds, it could be about opinions, it could be about pedestrians. So let's assume that you get a, a collection of, of, of agents, but it's not isotropically distributed. For some reason, let's assume that they are distributed, but there is a uh, cone, cone of vision, which is completely empty. Then the topological interaction will be actually infinite, right? It will be infinite because you can see forever because it's empty. And indeed, this is very realistic. That's what we are talking about. So the topological behavior is something which is in between local and global. It just changes the, 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 the point of view. Um, we just use it in order to highlight the fact that once you get a topological behavior uh, with a short range kernel, it is strong enough to enforce alignment even though you, you do not get any long tail. Repulsion, yes. You mentioned about the circular model. Well, one comment you make is that the first case are the same. Obviously, the dynamics are different, but the same case are the first case. Hold it, hold it, hold it, just a second. What do you mean the steady state will be the same? in the steady state. Yes, it, once I have the steady state. Yes. Yes, but of course now it will not be just... It is true, Jose, yes. So, so I'm sorry for, for, for in this kind of broad, you know, broad, broad. Uh, but it, it is very, it's, I would say it's somewhat restricted for, for the level I'm talking about here. Yes. Yes. So, Actually, I, w I would like to, 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 so I spent some time about this. Uh, I myself was, uh, uh, so, so I should mention that uh, both with Roman and with Ruben Shu, uh, it seems at the beginning that the repulsion is, uh, well, you just had the repulsion and then it's being confined by the, the, the other forces and from there on, uh, how complicated could it be? Um, and then uh, at, at one point, uh, I guess some of you know that there is this problem, I mean, I, I don't, uh, the Thompson problem, where you get the, the electrons and you had confinement by geometry rather than by, by attraction. And uh, I, I, I was not aware that this is an open problem from the beginning of, uh, beginning of time. And it seems such a simple problem that, right, you have an electrostatic uh, forces of repulsion and the confinement comes from the ball. And what is the limiting behavior? It's actually listed as one of the 21st century problem by, by smell, which then, then I, I decided, okay, I, now I start to understand that uh, you can confine the repulsion either by attraction or by the geometry or many other ways. But is in the second order case, it's considerably, really considerably more complicated.
So two comments on what you say. First, <coughs> yeah. so first, yeah, I mean, the, if the interaction is not symmetric, that's fine. I mean, it's like in the Moch Tadmor, that's not the point. What you say about this work about having a tree, the question is, does the tree allow to change in time? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that the tree does not change in time because uh, if they change in time, then you can change the topological behavior of the network and they do not cover that. Yeah, but the tree... This is a special case of the fact that the graph is connected. The key element is what happens when you change the topological nature of this network. And this, this is not addressed because this is inherently unstable. It's simply inherently unstable. So, so the first case, but you say you have a topological basis. Sorry? So you have a Fukushima model. Yes. So I don't understand. The, 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 the network need not be connected? Uh, it doesn't need to be connected all the time. But if it's not connected, then it will break down to different, to, the, the, to uh, un yeah, yeah, but then it will be uncommunicated uh, uh, clusters. I think I know what you're talking about, but I, I'm not convinced that this is the, uh, that this is the main message, yeah, because you assume that something persists and this assumption is hidden and it's very strong. That's, that's what I... Uh, what I'm saying is this is connected in can be direct to through the chemistry. Yeah, and the network operates. Maybe we can discuss Yeah, we can discuss this offline, okay. Yes. The momentum is not electron. Correct. No, no, no. So what happens here is that the, the once you have external, uh, when you have external potential, uh, what you really have to, to, to see is not a global conservation of the energy, but you have to look at the fluctuation because even though you have external potential, uh, the alignment force, I mean, so the, the key player is the alignment and the alignment with the external potential make the fluctuation decay. The question is decay around what? And as you can see, the K about limiting behavior, which is dictated by the external potential. 